We come to you today on this resurrection day. We thank you for the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his faithfulness to go to the cross for our sins. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for the power that lives in us through the resurrection, the hope of the resurrection because of his resurrection. We thank you for this time of the year when the earth proclaims the resurrection through new life in the trees, new life in the flowers. We can see a physical manifestation of resurrection. And it gives us hope that we will be resurrected. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we get started, uh, I mean, you know, we got the tape going, but uh, before we get with the, started with the message, I'd like to ask you a question. What's the only thing in heaven that is man-made? The only thing in heaven that is man-made. It's the nail prints in Jesus' hands and feet and the hole in his side where he was stuck with the spear. Today we celebrate the highest holy day in the Christian faith. We celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul put the uh, gospel in a nutshell in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Let's put that on the board. And the gospel means the good news. Now I make known to you, brethren. Well, that's actually verse one. Uh, let me just read the whole thing. Now I make known to you. This will be one through four. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received in which you also stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now here's the punchline, what, what uh, Paul is saying. Verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance, the main thing I'm trying to say to you, the first importance, what I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. All this didn't happen as an accident. It wasn't a surprise to God. He foretold of it in the scriptures. What scriptures? The Old Testament. The scriptures. The written word that they had at that time. Of course, Paul was writing more scriptures, but he was referring to the Old Testament. 3,000 years ago, King David wrote uh, Psalms 22. And it describes the crucifixion. The only thing is, 3,000 years ago, there was no such thing as crucifixion. Right. Capital punishment was stoning. And yet David described it to a T. And Psalms 22 says, uh, in fact, Crucifixion wasn't uh, invented until almost a thousand years later when the Romans used it to, to punish people and they wanted to make a spectacle of them 
so that you would say, hey, whatever he did, I want no part of. David was, right, was not writing this psalm about himself. He was writing it about Jesus being crucified on the cross. Psalms 22.1 starts out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, this was a direct quote that Jesus quoted when he was on the cross. And we won't have to turn to it, but uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was in Matthew 27 and, and uh, Mark 15. They verified, you know, what, what Jesus has said. Uh, verse 16, David said, They pierced my hands and my feet. And, and Thomas, after the resurrection, Thomas verified that uh, Jesus had, had uh, gone through this because he says, I won't believe unless I see the, the whole prince in his hands and put my finger in his side where the spear was. Psalms 14a says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. This just happens to describe what happens to the human body when it's hanging on a cross. That's what Jesus went through. David didn't experience it, but Jesus did. And the second half of, of 14 says, my heart is like wax. It is melted within me. This describes what happens when the heart is ruptured. And when that soldier stuck his spear in Jesus' side, it verified that Jesus' heart had been ruptured because blood and water came out. In verse 18 it says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lot. They cast lots. All four of the gospel writers verify that this happened. Somebody said one time, well, Jesus went around and he just tried to fulfill all of these old prophecies so that, you know, people would think he was the Messiah. But how could Jesus fulfill that? How could he fulfill what those Roman soldiers were doing? He even said what the, the Pharisees were going to say when they saw him up on the, on the cross. Well, come down and deliver yourself. He fulfilled them all because God laid out a plan and the plan was for him to be crucified, to be buried, and God said, I will raise him up on the third day. Not for Jesus, but for our sins was he crucified. You know, David not only prophesied, David was a king, but David was a prophet. And the scripture tells us that. Not only did he prophesy his death, how he would die, but he also prophesied the other two parts of what Paul wrote about the burial, and the resurrection. In Psalms 16.10, which happens to be my, my address, 16.10, but anyway, uh, in case you wondered. David said, Thou will not abandon my soul to Sheol. That's the Hebrew word for the grave. Now in the King James, sometimes it's translated the word hell. And in the New Testament, the New Testament is translated Hades. But it means, it means the grave. This is the burial of Jesus. It says, you will not abandon my soul to the grave. 
Well, if he's not going to abandon him to the grave, he has to be in the grave. All four of the gospel writers about the fact that Jesus was put into a tomb. They verified that this scripture was true. It was done according to the scripture. No surprise. Jesus told them, you know, hey, I'm going to suffer many things. I'm going to be crucified. They, they couldn't hear it. They couldn't understand it. But when he was raised from the dead, those scriptures were opened up to him. According to the scriptures. And I have all these scriptures, but uh, I seem to have a tendency to just pile on scriptures. And my wife says, well, you get, you get lost in all the scriptures. So I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to spare you a little bit. In fact... I have a few notes, <laughs> but I spent all day yesterday putting notes in and half the night last night <laughs> taking them out, but I'm trying to spare you. So we, we, we may be short after, after all said and done, but uh, all right, the second half of that scripture says, Neither will I allow the Holy One to undergo decay. This is the resurrection of Jesus. Notice Holy One is capitalized. It just happens to mention that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That Jesus was resurrected according to the scriptures. You remember the story of Lazarus? Jesus got there after four days and he says, roll back the stone. And Martha says, Lord, there'll be a stench. Well, you know what happens to the body after four days? It starts to smell. That's why Jesus was out of there in three. He did not undergo decay according to the scriptures. Uh, you know, I like that word. I like that phrase, according to the scriptures. I, I guess that's why when I try to teach, I use so many scriptures. That way it won't be according to Frank Butler. It'll be according to the scriptures. What Frank Butler tells you might hold as much water as a sieve. But the word of God... It will hold water. Because it is water. It's the living water. In Acts 2.27, Peter quoted what David had said in uh, Psalms 16.10. He, he quoted it and, and he says, in verse 29, he says, Brethren, I'm confident regarding the patriot David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us today. So, David wasn't writing about himself. David was a prophet and he was prophesying the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he was talking about when he says, you know, that he, that he won't. Uh, in fact, 31 says, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he, would never, that he would neither be abandoned to Hades, the grave, nor did his flesh suffer decay. God's plan, according to the scriptures. In verse 32, Peter said, This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. And Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 6, 
that Jesus appeared to 500 brethren at one time. 500, you know, how would you like to be a lawyer and go to court and have 500 witnesses? That's a slam dunk, isn't it? You know, when I was a kid, I was vaccinated with a polio vaccine so that I wouldn't get polio. You know what, it, it left a little scar there, wherever it is. It left a little scar. But I looked up the word vaccine. I looked it up in three dictionaries. The word vaccine in one said, a suspension of weakened or killed microorganism used to vaccinate. The second one said, a, sp a suspension of weakened or killed viruses or bacteria used to vaccinate. That's a little easier to understand. The third one said, any preparation introduced into the body to produce Im immunity to a specific disease. You know, some people are vaccinated from catching the gospel. Uh, I'm going to preaching now. <laughs> going to meddling, as somebody said. Well, how do you get vaccinated from the gospel? You simply introduce one's soul to a weakened or watered down or dead form of the gospel. Predominantly found in a dead church. Uh, we're getting serious now. How can one avoid immunity to the gospel? Does anybody here want to be immune to the gospel? No. I want to catch all of it I can catch. Amen. Well, the way to avoid immunity, you know, they, they take a dead organism, like, like the flu shot. You get, you get a, an organism a bacteria of the flu that has either, either been weakened or killed, they inject that in your body, and your body builds up resistance against that, an immunity, resistance. So if you get some watered down, dead gospel, you'll build up an immunity to the real thing. That's what I'm talking about. How do you avoid that? You believe the five fundamentals of the faith. You go to a church that preaches the five fundamentals of the faith. What are they? The deity of Christ. The virgin birth. The blood atonement. The resurrection, the second coming. If we, if we stop preaching those, run. That's it. That's it right there. Some people have said, well, we serve the same God you do. Does the God you serve line up with that? If not, run. The Bible is about relationships. God's relationship with man. Man's relationship with God. Man's relationship with man. And God's desire 
to restore man's relationship with God. Jesus came to restore man's relationship with God. He suffered greatly in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mental anguish. That was before he went to the cross. On the cross he suffered, suffered physically. And he suffered when he took our sins and was separated from his heavenly Father. I think that may have been the most suffering that he had to endure. He had never, from all eternity past, ever been separated from God the Father. Let's look at the cross from another perspective. God suffered too. If you saw the passion of the Christ when Jesus was on the cross, a giant teardrop came from heaven. That was from God the Father. The reason God cried was he had to turn away. He couldn't look at sin on his son. Jesus became our sin. And God had to look away. God had to turn. And it hurt the father as well as the son. If you remember the, the story of the prodigal son, it was the father that was standing, waiting, looking, always waiting, hoping for the return of his son. And when his son returned, while he was still a long way off, the father saw him. The father got happy. The father felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And then they threw a big party. They celebrated. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the celebration in heaven when Jesus returned to heaven and the Father and the angels embraced him and welcomed him home? You know, it said when, when Jesus was on the cross that he could have called 12 legions of angels. A legion is 6,000. He could have called, he could have called 72,000 angels to come rescue him. In the Old Testament, one angel killed 185,000 men. Those angels could have wiped out the whole world. That was power in restraint. The ability to do that and, and not do it, to hold back, that's power. Just like James and John said, do you want us to call down fire? Jesus said, whoa, now, wait, wait a minute. You, you don't know what spirit you're of. Right. You might have the power. They had the power to do it. If Jesus would have said, go for it, boys, they had the power to do it. But after all of the abuse that Jesus took, physical, mental, emotional, He blew away the Roman soldier and he blew away the thief on the cross when he looked down and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do.
I want to read some lyrics from a song by Chris Tomlin. It's called Good, Good Father. Linda has sung it here many times. And when it comes on the radio, I just reach for the knob. I, I crank it up. Listen to these lyrics. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. But I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. You tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide. But I know we're all searching for answers only you provide. Because you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm, uh, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Because you're perfect in all your ways. You're perfect in all your ways. You're perfect in all your ways. Oh, it's a love so undeniable, I, I can hardly speak. Peace so unexplainable, I can, I can hardly think. As you call me deeper still into love, love, love. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. And he's talking about God the Father. The first sentence in that song says, Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. Where do you get your information about what the Father is like? I hope it comes from the Bible and from a personal relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. And people say, oh, well, the Bible was written by men. Yeah. Men inspired by the Holy Spirit. Right. Who wrote the information that you, that you believe? Who inspired that? Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no, under, no, no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which men must be saved. And there is salvation in no one else. What is the purpose of salvation? It's to restore the fellowship and right standing with, with God that men originally had in the Garden of Eden and to give us eternal life. What is eternal life? Who do you think would be the best person to tell us what eternal life is except for the person that gives us eternal life? John 17, 3, Jesus said, and this is eternal life. I'm going to say that again. Jesus said, and this 
is eternal life. Right, what is this? This is eternal life. That they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Eternal life. I thought that meant just living forever. No, it means knowing God, the Father, and His Son, who He sent. Knowing, having a personal relationship with. That's eternal life. You can know about God and end up in an eternal hell. Like what uh, Phil was sharing. There are going to be some, some tears in heaven that will be wiped away. But there's going to be some tears in hell that will never go away. The weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right. You know, Jesus prayed for his disciples and in John this was before he went to the cross he prayed for his disciples and in John 17 20 he says not only have I prayed for you but I've prayed for those that will believe the words that you have said you know what that means that means he prayed for us if you believe the words that the disciples said about Jesus in the scriptures, then Jesus had prayed for you. Yeah. And Hebrews 7.25 says, He is able to save forever. Who is He? Jesus. Jesus is able to save forever those who draw near to God through, excuse me, through Him since he always lives to make intercession for them. You know, there is a man in heaven sitting at the right hand of God. He's the son of God and he's the son of man. And he's interceding for you. When Linda fell, Jesus was interceding for her. I believe he sent a couple of angels and said, catch her now. Catch her. Hurry, hurry. That's right. I'm going to leave that one with Peyton Manning. He can do all the, the hurry, hurry he wants. I'm, he's retired from football and I'm going to retire from hurry, hurry. <laughs> now, the people on the, on the tape won't understand what we're talking about, but it was a little testimony earlier. So, the, the recorded message is good, but sometime you have to get here, you have to be here to hear the whole story. I almost said hurry, hurry, but I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to leave that one. It's, it's all about a relationship. Well, well what, what is God like? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Colossians 1.15 says... And he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And if you go down a little bit further, Colossians 2, 2 through 3, and I'm just, I'm just going to pick a part out of here. It says that uh, God's mystery is that in Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want wisdom? You want knowledge? 
Seek Jesus Christ. And when you find Jesus, guess what? what? He'll introduce you to the Father. Years ago, there was an anti-drug program called Just Say No. It was a pretty good program. It told you to just, just say no to drugs. But a long time before that, God had a program called Just Say Yes. Yes to salvation. Now, now I want you to watch this. Jesus', is, Jesus is name in Hebrew is Yeshua, which means salvation. You know how you spell Yeshua? Y-E-S-H-U-A. Yes. Say yes to salvation. Say yes to Jesus. It's in the scriptures. That's it, buddy, right here. The scriptures. They will set you free. All right, I'm going to close with this, with this analogy. There was a man on a tightrope pushing a wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls. The crowd was going crazy. He got to the other side and he looked at the crowd and he says, you think I can do it again? And they said, yeah, man, we believe you can do it again. He says, okay, get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> do you believe Jesus can save you? Yeah. Get in the wheelbarrow. Yeah. If anybody needs prayer, I would invite you to come up. And if not, we'll be dismissed. And if you, need, if you need to talk to somebody, if you need prayer, come. If you're watching on the internet, watching a CD, listening to the... To the uh, what, watching a DVD or listening to uh, the CD, get a hold of us. We'll be glad to share the gospel with you according to the scriptures. Thank you.